it's what we're doing tonight. Let's do 11. Okay. All right. Okay, we are going to get going here. Um, just to let you know, next week we're going to have um, a review class. I feel like it's time to do that. Do, do you agree? We, we've covered 11 lessons. Well, tonight will be the 11th. And I think it's time for us to kind of revisit the ground that we've covered. So if you want to do something this week, which would be great, um, put your lessons in order. If, if you don't have them in order right now, um, bring, bring all your lessons, your folder, next time. And um, if you want to prepare for the review, what you can do, and it will prepare you pretty well, is read through the questions at the end of each of the lessons. And that would just really help you. Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and start with a prayer and get going here. Dear Father in Heaven, um, thank you for this night. Um, thank you for the cold weather and the turn of season. And thank you that um, we were all well enough to make it out tonight. We do want to pray um, for all those who are not doing well tonight and um, the large number of people who are suffering with COVID. Um, please help their bodies to be strong and please help them recover quickly. Um, we also want to pray for those who are um, dealing with cancer and other health issues, Father. It, it's, such a, it's such a burden. And we just pray that you would lift their spirits and give their bodies strength and, and be with them through this process and heal them, Father, according to your will. We also want to pray for those who are grieving, and um, we want to pray for, for those who are suffering um, private, secret sorrows, um, that you would be with them and give them the comfort that comes from your Holy Spirit. Father, um, tonight as we study, um, help us marvel at your plan, um, the way history has unfolded, and um, the wonderful men and women you've used to um, bring Jesus to the earth to save us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so if you have your sheets handy, but you can do it without, turn to page 37, and let's just one time go through our 16 Old Testament people. How many people have worked on this and have memorized them? Okay, okay I'm going to get going because I have to go fast tonight. All right, here we go. Um, just say it with me. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Gideon, Samuel, Saul, David, Solomon, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Nehemiah. Good. Okay, now let's do our six time periods of Old Testament history. Probation, preparation, conquest, power, decline, servitude. I think those make sense, but certainly after we study each one of them one at a time, I think they will make good sense. Oh, okay. All right, so let's let's talk about the, the period of conquest. That goes from Moses to Samuel. So that is going to include the wilderness wanderings, the conquest of Canaan, and the time period of the judges. So the books that are included in the period of conquest go from Exodus to Leviticus. So this gives us a chance to do some of our books too. So let's do that. Forget about Genesis, right? 
Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel. And that's our cutoff right there. Okay. Um, so the time in the wilderness, um, we all know that it was um, 40 long years. And we know that there was a lot that happened during that period. A lot of um, hardships and testing of God's people. Um, and they didn't always um, pass the test. In fact, God at one point says, you've tested me these 10 times. And sure enough, you can go back and count them. 10, 10 rebellions in the wilderness. But I wanted to read what, what um, God said about this time period. So I'm going to read from Deuteronomy 8, 14 um, through 17. So this is on the brink of um, them crossing over the Jordan 40 years later. And this is what um, God is actually warning them not to be proud and not to forget the journey. The journey was really supposed to help them learn a whole lot of things. But anyway, in Deuteronomy 8, beginning of verse 14, he says, this is God speaking, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty, waterless land, with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known, to humble and to test you so that in the end, it might go well with you. So that those 40 years were really a, a time period of formation for them. I, I heard a, a Jewish man once said, say that they came out of the desert physically very strong, but mentally and spiritually weak. And that time in the desert reintroduced them to the God of Israel. And through all those hardships, it prepared them to become a nation. They left slaves, right? They got to the brink of the promised land of prepared people, of people ready to go in to uh, conquer. So um, during that time, in the wilderness, they received the Ten Commandments, and they also built the tabernacle. They sat at Mount Sinai one year. Did you know that? One year. And it was during that time that they built, um, they gathered and built um, the tabernacle, which went with them for the rest of those years. Okay, so here we have, um, the map of the Exodus, so I'm going to come around, and if you want to look at yours, um, you also, you don't have a map of the Exodus, you have the compass. So, so this is got to be it. So they, they crossed the Red Sea, they came down to Mount Sinai, and then who knows what happens then? They just did circles all over the place, and there are uh, places, in fact, you can actually look at this, but we're not going to but you can look at um, Numbers 33, I mentioned this before, and it mentions all the places they camp for a significant time period. And as it turns out, there's 40 of them. Go figure, 40 years and, and 40 major encampments. So, um, but they did, they turned circles here before it came time them to travel this way and get ready to enter the land. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Okay, so um, in fact, this is very interesting. Um, 
Um, did you know, kind of, like I said, there's 40 major places they can't. But it didn't always go like that. It's not like they spent a year at each place. Let's see how God describes that time period. Um, I'm going to be reading from Numbers 9, uh, verses 15 and following. Okay. Um, so this, this is at the end of that first year. Because like I said, they spent a year at the foot of Mount Sinai. So this is uh, as they're going to embark on the journey. Okay, uh, Numbers 9, 15. On the day of the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony was set up. The cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. That is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night, it looked like fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Whenever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at his command, they encamped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. When the cloud rem remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was over the tabernacle only a few days. At the Lord's command, they would encamp, and then at his command, they would set out. Sometimes the cloud stayed only from evening till morning. Would you like to pick up all your camping gear like that? Um, and when it lifted in the morning, they set out, whether by day or by night. Whenever it lifted, they set out. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days, or a month, or a year, the Israelites would remain in camp and not set out. But when it lifted, they would set out. At the Lord's command, they encamped. Is this getting redundant? And at the Lord's command, they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with his command through Moses. Wow. What is he teaching them here? Obedience, right? This sounds like the kind of thing you say to children. Now, when I say, you know, do this, then you're going to do it. Now, when I don't say that, you're not going to, you know what I'm saying? He's really emphasizing, I think there's a good reason why they're called the children of Israel. Because they're coming out as slaves. And they have to be trained. They have to be prepared. They have to be ready and matured for all that's going to take place later. OK. Um, and as I pointed out, you can look at Numbers 33 to see all of those 40 major encampments. OK, let's go on to the conquest of, and so we associate the, the wilderness wanderings with Moses, right? Okay. Um, the conquest of Canaan we associate with who? Joshua. Jo Joshua, right? So, um, God, uh, well, let me, let me get you another. So you, I believe you do have a map like this. I mean, um, tell you the page here. This would this page would be 43. Um, I gave you these maps um, with your packet. And um, in the book, they're kind of out of order. But I tried to put them in better order for you. OK. So uh, let me show you, show you what's happening with the map. And then I'll come back and tell you. Um, the next part. Okay, so we saw we saw on the other map how they they were down here, uh, wandering for those thirty nine years, and then they come up and here's here's our Jordan River, right? Sea of Galilee. 
Dead Sea. They come up and they have to go around Edom and Moab because those are um, Lot's descendants and Esau's descendants. And God gave them land and said, you can't have it. And so they try to pass through, but nobody wants them to pass through. But anyway, so they go around and they, they come up here. Moses, of course, is still their leader. He's still alive. And Reuben, Manasseh, and um, Gad say, we like this land. And we don't want to cross over. So three out of the 12 um, tribes say, we have lots of cattle, lots of livestock. There's good pasture land here. We want to stay here. So Moses said, only if you guys, the men, are, are willing to cross over and help their brothers conquer the land. After, after the land is secured, you can go back. But Moses is still alive, and they do war with Og and some of these other Agag and some of these other people. Not Agag, Og, though. And um, um, so this is their, their first real warlike battles. And they conquered this land, and then Moses dies here on Mount Nebo. Then they come in, and there's Jericho. We all know about Jericho, right? And that was one of the most fortified cities. There were a good number of cities that had uh, walls around them and were uh, mighty and fortified. It wasn't just Jericho. But Jericho, if any of you guys know this, you probably do, had two walls. It had two walls around it. And it was fortified in between. So it's kind of like the Titanic. You say it's unsinkable. Well, Jer Jericho was like the crowning city of all these walled cities because it had that double wall. So you can imagine that that's why God wanted them to come against Jericho first because all the other people in the land are going to say, hey, if they got Jericho, we're toast. Wall or no wall, right? So um, from there, Joshua leads them down and the southern area had more of the big cities and more of the fortified and, and uh, walled cities than the north. So they come down here and they conquer this whole area. This is the southern campaign. And then they come up here and they conquer uh, the northern area after, just to give you an idea of the conquest. And all of that is accomplished by the end of Joshua chapter 11. Okay, um, all right, so I've heard people say, like I told you guys before, when I went to college, I just heard all this stuff. Um, but I've heard people say, oh, you know, God is just so mean. He took that land away from those wonderful native inhabitants of land. And as far back as um, Genesis 15, when God is talking with Abraham, he talks about the wickedness of those people. But he actually gives them 400 additional years to repent. But, but here's, here's what uh, God says in Deuteronomy about that about conquering Canaan and about uh, why he is allowing them to drive out and kill the inhabitants of the land. If they wanted to drive out, good, fine, dandy. But a lot of times that's not what happened. All right, um, so this is Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14. When you enter the land, the Lord your God is giving you, giving you do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. And there were at least eight groups of people living in the land there. So they have detestable ways, God says. Now, what are these detestable ways? Verse 10. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or his daughter in fire. Do you hear that? 
They were sacrifice, human sacrifice. And they were sacrificing their own children. Now, if I'm God and I'm watching that, that's all I need to hear. I'm done. The, these people are out. Okay? But they were doing other things as well. Um, let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or his daughter in fire. Can you? I mean, I, I can't get over that. Sacrificing my children in fire? What is that? You know? Okay, I'm going to go on. Who practices divination or sorcery, who interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, who are these people? Who cast spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or consults the dead? Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. But you must be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations you will dis dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery and divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has commanded you not to do so. So does that make sense? There, in fact, it talks about them polluting the land and corrupting the land. That's how God viewed it, and, and rightly so. Okay, so um, Joshua, and I'm reading Joshua 11.23, so Joshua took the entire land just as the Lord had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel, according to their tribal divisions. Then the land had rest from war. So I'm going to come around again. Um, nor did Ephraim 
dried out the Canaanites from Gezer. Verse 30, neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites, etc. Verse 31, nor did Asher drive out those living in Akko, Sidon, etc. Um, verse 33, neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh. And on we go. They just didn't finish the job. Joshua gave them their land, he gave them their tribes, and he said, now go possess the land. And they didn't do it. And God warned them that, I'm not going to read that one, but God warned them. He said, there are going to be thorns in your side and pricks in your eye if you don't finish the job. So they were, they were carefully instructed, warned, and trained to do this, but they did not do it. Um, so, so what happens? In, in Judges um, chapter 2, we see what happens. Um, beginning in verse 6. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the, the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his own inheritance. Verse 10. After that, the whole generation that had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who uh, knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Verse 11, Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. One generation later, and they are already serving these false gods of this land. And what kind of stuff do these people do? Do you remember? Yeah, just all kinds of evil, wicked, bloodthirsty, creepy things. So that's how quickly it happened because they didn't obey God and finish their job. Okay, so we enter in now um, to, the, to the rule of the judges. And uh, what we see, and, and I'm going to be reading from uh, Judges chapter 2, verses um, six, through, 6 through 11. It says, Now after Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, Oh, that's, I already did that. Uh, chapter, chapter 2, verse 16. Then the Lord raised up judges, because at this point, they're, they're being oppressed. They, the people become strong again. It's their, it was their land, right? They know it better than the Israelites do. They repopulate, repopulate, and how do you think they feel about the Israelites being there? Not too good. So they had slavery in Egypt. Now they have oppression. All right. Uh, verse 16 of uh, chapter 2. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked, the way of obedience to the Lord's command. Right? Because the generation of Joshua was good. They were obedient. And the generation of the elders who outlived Joshua, they were also good. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, God was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as that judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned 
under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and their stubborn ways. So I have a little chart here for you. It's called the cycle <coughs> of the judges. Okay. So what happens is they fall into apostasy. They worship other gods. They intermingle, they intermarry, um, they adopt the practices of the peoples of the land, and they end up being oppressed by the people right, I mean, among them. They're, they're, they're trying to mingle with them, they're trying to serve the same gods, and the people get strong, and they end up oppressing Israel. Then they, they cry out in their affliction and they beg God um, to help them and he, they, they come to repentance and he sends them a deliverer, a judge, who in that generation um, relieves them. And so the judge lives for a while and they get complacent again they're delivered, and then the cycle begins. And there are 15 major judges in the book of Judges. So this happens 15 times. And they're still really not learning their lesson. And so that takes it. So Gideon is one, there's like three chapters devoted to what Gideon does. He was considered faithful. Um, although he he was he was um, all of these judges, unfortunately, except Samuel, were influenced by their culture, and that that's a good lesson for us today. It's so easy to be influenced by our culture, and sometimes we don't even know we are influenced by their culture. But they all had. I I consider this as a nation for Israel. I consider this the dark ages. You know, they went backwards. They, they became more ignorant. They became um, less civilized, very, very uncivilized. And so because they did not listen to these judges, and because there was no unifying national government, um, the motto that goes with this entire period is, um, in those days, Israel had no king, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And you can see that that it's Judges 17 verse 6. Uh, in brief, you find it in um, chapter 18, chapter 19, and then the last verse of the book, um, the last book, I mean last verse, is... And in those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as he saw fit. So how is it when you have a couple million people and everybody's doing something different? doesn't work too good. So um, that, that ends the judges, although Samuel is the last and greatest judge, and he is so much better. He's head and shoulders above all of the others. He restores the law. He brings spirituality, he brings integrity, he brings righteousness, um, and a lot of people don't know this, he even fought battles, but Samuel was by far the most wonderful and greatest judge of them all, and he anointed both Saul and David. And he's kind of, to me, a figure, I mean, he's not the same, and he's not really like, but I think of him along the lines of John the Baptist, kind of Samuel was preparing the people for what was going to happen next when they were going to get a, a king, even though they rejected God and they shouldn't have. Um, this, this did work into the plan. Okay. Next we go to the United Kingdom.
them, and I don't know how much of this I'm going to be able to do, but the United Kingdom is 120 years. It's Saul, David, and Solomon, the, the three kings of the period of power. So now we're into the period of power, and it's, it's, it's Israel's golden age. Now, now, Saul had a tough job because um, they were fragmented and they were still, they had a lot of baggage from um, the period of the judges. So uh, Saul has a lot to do and Saul uh, messes up big time. You know, uh, there's at least three, three times Saul uh, basically rebels against God and for that reason he did not receive a dynasty. In other words, his family, his sons did not follow him and be kings. Um, and he died in, in dishonor. But in his early time as king, there's a couple of good things that really can be said about Saul. And I want to read to you um, out of 1 Samuel 14. Um, I think I read two of these verses before, uh, 47, 48, and then 52. After Saul had assumed rule over Israel, he fought against their enemies on every side. And there's a lot of enemies. And it's 1 Samuel 14, 47, and 48. After Saul had assumed rule over Israel, he fought against their enemies on every side. Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Zoba, and the Philistines, those dreaded Philistines. Wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment on them. He fought valiantly and defeated the Amalekites, delivering Israel from the hands of those who had plundered them. Hey, he did some things right, right? He had a big job to do, and he was valiant. And he uh, took the reins of, of the rule of Israel, and he began to subdue the land. Um, and he began, the worst enemy, truly, was probably the Philistines. And Saul began to do that. Um, Verse 52, all the days of Saul, there was bitter war with the Philistines. So David is going to come in, and he's going to finish the job with the Philistines. All right. But as you know, after those rebellions uh, of Saul, he sacrificed like a priest when he shouldn't have. And they were in the middle of war, and, and the soldiers were hungry, and he wouldn't let them eat. And then... Uh, God said, deal with the Amalekites, and, and Saul went to war, but he saved the king, he saved the booty, he saved all the best stuff, and God said, no, in the case of the Amalekites, I don't want you to do that, because they're the ones that attacked Israel when they first came out of Egypt and killed all the weak, the, uh, the, old, the elderly, the frail. And God saw that, that was an abomination to God. And he said, because they preyed on the, the infirm and the weak, I'm going to obliterate them. So um, Saul, when he went to war against them, uh, he salvaged what God told him not to salvage, and that was kind of the final straw. God said, I made it clear, I told you, and you know why. And so he said, your kingdom is not going to endure, and it's going to be given to your neighbor who's better than you, meaning, meaning David. Okay, um, so uh, Saul dies on Mount Gilboa. I'm going to read a couple of verses here. This is Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 31. It says, now the Philistines fought against Israel. And the Israelites fled before them, and many fell slain on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines pressed hard after Saul and his sons, and they killed his son Jonathan, ow, that really hurts, Abinadab and Malkishua. 
The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. And then verse 6, so Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men died together on the same day. So that's, that's really sad. Okay, so we go on to David, and I'm going to be reading in 1 Samuel. I'm kind of hurrying so I can do as much of this as I can. Um, in 1 Samuel 5, verses 4 through 7 and 9 through 12. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. Um, verse 6. The king and his men, oh, and this is because Jerusalem becomes the capital city of, of Israel. And that's one of the things the uh, material asked me to cover is the fact that David not only secured the land, but he established the capital for Israel, made, giving it more nationhood, giving it a central place of worship and government. Okay, um, verse 6. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought, David cannot get in here. Verse 7, nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. Verse 9, David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward. Verse 10, and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. Verse 11, now Hiram, the king of Tyre, sent messengers to David along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a palace for David there in Jerusalem. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. So nations around are now acknowledging Israel as a nation. And nations around are acknowledging David as the king and Jerusalem as the capital. So it's full nationhood at this point. Um, and then in chapter 6 of verse uh, of 2 Samuel, verse 6, this is when the Ark of the Covenant, it, it had been at Bethel and Shiloh and Gibeon, all these places, and um, God now is bringing it to, through David, to Jerusalem, so that Jerusalem will also be um, the spiritual capital of the people. Uh, verse 12, it says, Now David was told by God, the Lord has blessed the, the household of Eben Elam and everything he has because of the Ark of the Covenant. It was there for a while. So David went down and brought the Ark of, the, of God from the house of Oben Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Okay. Um, and then uh, in chapter 8, verses 1 and 15, here's, here's David finally. Um, getting control over those horrible, pesky Philistines. They're, they were terrible. Um, chapter 8 of 2 Samuel, verse 1. And in the course of time, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. And he took Methag Amma from the control of the Philistines. Verse 15. And David reigned over all Israel, doing justice and righteousness for all his people, and he was. David was became the gold standard of all kings. Every king that came after him is, is um, compared to him. Um, he obeyed the commandments like David. Um, he did not walk in the ways of David. Um, he did good and righteousness for the people like David. And David did David, David from this point on 
he is the gold standard for all of the kings to be compared to. Okay, um, now Solomon, he started out really well. And so I'll, I'll read a little bit about him. And of course, we know that he built the temple. I had all these verses so you could see how much David did to prepare for the building of the temple. But it was so long, I, I just decided, just tr j trust me, David collected everything from, from the stone to the bronze to the, to the gold that covered the temple. And it says at the end of his life, he bequeathed his entire personal fortune because he had become very rich to the building of the temple. And he, God gave him the plans for the temple, which he gave to Solomon. I said, David did everything except pick up a hammer and a saw because he loved it and he wanted it to happen. You know, it was in his, his heart and in his mind to build it in the first place, right? But he was a man of war, and we've seen that. David made Israel the size it became in your other map, if you want to pull that out, the last map, where it shows um, the United Kingdom. It looks like this. See that huge area? David conquered that and just basically handed it over to Solomon. Okay, and it's just like it was prophesied in Genesis. It went all the way, at, you see the north tip, the north end, it went all the way to the Euphrates River. And God, God had foretold that in Genesis, and all the way to what they call the Brook of Egypt in the south. So you see, Solomon and David, um, reigned over a huge territory. And you can see some of the peoples that were in there that also came under that reign and they paid tribute and so forth. And then unfortunately that darker area in the middle is after um, Israel splits and becomes um, two nations. Do you see how it shrinks? Yeah, they had, if they had obeyed God, they would have stayed large and, and powerful. All right, really quickly, I'm just going to read you a few verses about Solomon. This is 1 Kings 3, 3, 9 through 13. Now Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except he sacrificed and burnt incense on the high places. Okay, now skipping down to um, verse 9, Solomon's prayer to God as he begins um, his time as king and his desire to reign wisely and well. This is Solomon praying. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people and to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? And it was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Verse 12, God speaking, Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart, so that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall there arise after you anyone like you. And I have also given you what you have not asked. I give you both riches and honor, so that there will not be among any kings of the earth anyone like you in all your days. So looking at your map, um, chapter 4, verse 21. Now Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the river, meaning the Euphrates, to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. And they all brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Verse 25. So Judah and Israel lived safely, every man under his vine and fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Okay, two words. Okay, and I have to mention the temple. Um, this is chapter 6. I'm going to be reading from chapter 6, um, verses 
114, 37, and 38. Now it came about in the 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. So 480 years have passed since they left Egypt. So this is really an important scripture because it's positive identification of the time period and how many years have passed. In the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, he began to build the house of the Lord. Verse 14. So Solomon built the house and finished it. Verse 37. In the fourth year, the foundation of the Lord was laid in the month of Zeb. And in the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished with all of its parts according to all of its plans. So he was seven years in building it. So Solomon, this is chapter 10, verse 23. So Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth, both in riches and in wisdom. So that's, um, that's our study for tonight. I'm going to let you go. Let's, let's quickly have a prayer. Thank you for indulging me. I, it's been agonizing cutting things down. All right. Um, dear Father in heaven, um, thank you for all of this wealth of truth and knowledge and history um, that you've just given to us in your word so that we can learn from the, the victories and the blessings and um, the successes of those who have gone before us so that we can see prophecies even all the way back in Genesis, fulfilled right before our eyes. And thank you for also being honest, God. You're honest and righteous and truthful, God. You also tell us of the mistakes and the failures of the ones that you love who've gone before us, and yet you're honest about them, though they're your beloved. And we thank you for the examples, both good and bad, and the warnings included to help us learn and, and follow in your ways and not do as, as some have done in deserting you and forsaking you, rebelling against you, or not listening. So, Father, we thank you for all of this, and we thank you for, for Jesus, who's the one to come, who's the one all of this is for the one that is the ultimate fulfillment of all the prophecies and the one who brought the plan into total fulfillment. So we thank you for him. And in his name we pray. Amen. Oh, yeah, there's no next lesson because, thank you, because next week is our big review. Okay? So we're going to... We are, but not not before the, the uh, review. I just feel like, look back at your lessons. Look back at the first 11, 11 lessons and kind of take a look at what we've covered. We've covered some ground. Thank you. <laughs>